Fei Zhu from UBC. And he's, he's going to talk to us on reversible far away from equilibrium dynamics near quantum critical points, entropy production, viscosity, and conformal symmetry. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I need to hold this. Ah, okay. Okay. okay um, uh, it's, uh, it's my great pleasure to be here um, on such a beautiful day. <laughs> um, and uh, I want to talk about something that we work on for uh, quite a few years, my student and I, and my postdoc. And only very recently, uh, we gradually realized that those theoretical efforts we made during the last few years um, can lead to something very concrete from an experimental point of view. And that's basically what I'd like to talk about today. I think it's a great audience, a um, lot of experimentalists, and uh, I was you know, our thinking of experiments might be a little bit naive from an experimental point of view, but that's, you know, sort of a theory that that's almost the best we can do, <laughs> that, you know, you know the, 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 the connection that we try to make, okay? So a couple of things I want to introduce here. Um, now equilibrium dynamics in the generic context, usually um, it's associated with the entropy production. And so it's usually generically they are irreversible, okay? I can give give you a few examples in a few minutes. Um, so I, having reversible and far away from equilibrium dynamics um, to us, it's uh, highly surprising. And of course, this doesn't come with no price. You have to um, sort of fine tune your interaction so that as an emergent uh, scale and conformal uh, symmetry, but this can be easily achieved uh, in the context of uh, quantum criticality. So that's why um, the critical physics uh, is very relevant and, and, and the consequential uh, symmetry that usually not there in genetic system can emerge around the critical points and then there's a very dramatic uh, prediction coming out of that. So I'm gonna skip most of the theoretical part of the argument. I just show you some simple pictures and show you a very simple experimental setup could be possibly realized in, in uh, uh, Peter's lab or other people's uh, Deep's lab. I don't know, I mean, you tell me what, uh, whether it's doable, okay? Um, so this, uh, the PhD student, uh, mainly this particular project I'm gonna talk about mainly is by Jeff Makey, uh, who just graduated. And I also collaborate with a uh, uh, former associate who is a member of uh, Chinese uh, Science of Academy and then also my current postdoc, Fan Yan. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so what, just very brief introduction about, um, maybe let me skip this one. Let me just go straight to the quantum criticality. Uh, let me introduce the quantum critical physics. So. The uh, very large fraction of the theoretical condensed matter uh, efforts actually are put to understand the emergent properties. Um, uh, the most famous one, of course, is superfluid superconductor, which break the U1 symmetry uh, at a low temperature. Um, there are modern ones, which are more abstract, which involve the development of non-local topological order. Those are related to uh, fractional quantum Hall, um, spin liquid, which do not break the symmetry in the standard way, but there's a, a long, you know, non-local order encoded there. Uh, in, in either this, uh, of these classes that the property uh, of those large quantum system, those property cannot be easily um, extrapolated just by saying that I have electrons or I have neutral atoms there, um, and then go from there to extrapolate property. Um, the property you can extrapolate from the microscopic particle is totally different from the large quantum system. Okay, so that's basically what uh, Phil Anderson said almost 40, 40 years ago, more is different. It's very different from few body, two body, three body. Uh, and the reason why they are so different, so surprising, um, for instance, the fraction quantum Hall system, the elementary excited, if you put a you know, electrons together, putting semiconductor form 2D gas, apply strong magnet field, the interaction will be such that it will produce elementary excitation with one third of electron charge. 
that's not something you can extrapolate from electron itself, right? From fundamental particle point of view, all charges quantize at one unit. But you can get a fractionized one. You can even get a um, not abelian statistics when you break those quasi particles. So those are a huge class of emergent phenomena. And one of the reason why they are so difficult to understand just starting from the stuff we know, uh, fundamental particle is because um, they usually separate from the normal, more conventional matter by quantum critical points or critical points in general. So that, that, that's why the critical point physics also play very, very central role in many, many studies of uh, interacting system, emergent phenomena in general. So here is the very um, standard picture of the critical, uh, especially uh, quantum critical point. So you can think about uh, this horizontal axis is the quantum axis, zero temperature, and you can tune the interaction. You can think about spin system. You start with the uh, anti-ferromagnet or ferromagnet, which is what we call order. And then you can add in frustration, this axis, certain quantum frustration to disorder in the quantum way. So then you generate a point where around this axis, you will have a phase transition. This is a standard order from disorder, but in the quantum way. But now, if you put in special dimension two, then you will find out this transition only happens at a zero temperature. So that's the simplest example of quantum critical point. It's just one point in your phase space. So if you're sitting at a high temperature, then there's no phase transition. So this is very similar to the um, uh, liquid vapor transition. You get a first order, but if you go to pressure high enough, at some point, the first order transition terminated at uh, one critical point. Afterwards, you cannot tell the difference. Right? So very similar in the very general uh, context, but the, except here, this whole thing happened at a zero temperature axis. Now the very strong statement that we learned during the last 20 years, um, especially last five, 10 years, and there's a dramatic development here is that this quantum critical point physics um, has a lot to do with the physics that we know in other areas. So generally speaking, what we know now is if you want to describe the quantum critical point physics, this requires a special set of the uh, tool because this point usually have the emergent symmetry. Um, the symmetry at this point is much higher than other points. So in many cases, you will have emergent Lorentz symmetry. You take the lattice to start with, you can never imagine why this is relevant, but they actually show up, okay? And then uh, consequentially, because of scale symmetry at this point, you then blow the whole group into a much bigger structure called a conformal group. And so the whole thing, the, the emerging symmetry here is very unique. And it's much bigger than the symmetry sitting around it. And the very interesting thing is now, um, so this is the connection to the more modern way of, of how to think about think about the quantum critical point, because this point have, can have emergent Lorentz invariance and conformal symmetry. This can be related to the conformal field theory that developed in the string theory that the CFT usually is considered to be a natural representation of the ADS space, the boundary, the, bound, the boundary bulk edge correspondence. And uh, the boundary of, to be more precise, it's called a near horizon limit. Uh, the boundary of the five dimension at the S5 actually is exactly the corresponding to three plus one D physical system CFT theory. So the correspondence theory developed in the string theory therefore able to allow us to do computation sometimes. And I think Damson was the first one actually utilize those correspondence. At this point, the interaction is so strong, the usual perturbative approach usually, uh, it's completely not reliable. One cannot do much. But with this bulk edge correspondence, actually one can do something. So there, there have been a lot of very impressive progress around this quantum critical point. For instance, if you move up around the temperature, if you move horizontally, start from this point, move horizontally, it's almost like you start with the the, the boundary and then walk into the interior where the symmetry is no longer there. Okay, 
But if you walk vertically up, then it's almost like you start with ADSF space, inject the black hole into the system, and you allow the Hawking radiation create a physics which is uh, very much mimic what happened at this point, for instance. And then you can go in up and down to this kind of method. So in the modern days, uh, especially during the last five, 10 years, we normally think this type of physics, if you're able to study the dynamics around this line, that dynamics actually pretty much can be mapped into certain uh, ADS CFT dynamics and, the, and the vice versa. So for us, um, a very interesting question, a lot of interesting question can ask. And this bottom one perhaps fits into this workshop very well. So I know that a lot of AMO physicists do. So we've been working on a couple of things, my own group. Um, this is a really for the solid state system. You know, they do the transport and we ask what kind of transport you can have, uh, uh, which will be similar to the transport uh, if you're able to do it near the horizon of uh, ADS. And then quantum hydrodynamics recently being studied in graphing. So this is a very difficult system to achieve in solid state because it requires ultra clean system and that's only become available very recently. Right? Um, and then there's you know, more on the theoretical side, understanding how the topological matter you know, with the non-local topological to make a phase transitions. But this part is really what I like to talk about because it's so much related to uh, co-atom, especially the flash rock physics. So, so I'm gonna focus on this one, just tell you why we are interested in this. Um, you know, far away from equilibrium dynamics, what's the consequence of those emergent symmetry? Okay. So let me introduce the, the issue we uh, recently realized that it can be very much done using the this flash rock resonance. Okay. So uh, let's talk about the one of the best known example of the uh, non-equilibrium dynamics that we usually teach students in the 100 physics class. It's a free expansion of gas. So you have a box of gas and release into the larger space. Uh, if you look at the momentum space, normally what happens is that uh, in the gas, uh, when the gas is in the box, you get, um, you get a quantized level there. So you get an occupied state. And if you unoccupied the state, for instance, the entropy is relatively low here because there are only very few configurations you can do within for the given number of the states available. So this, this, this solid line basically tells you where you should you know, fix your phase space because the temperature is fixed. So if you go to very high temperature because the Boltzmann weight, they're all suppressed. So roughly speaking, you have to do the create entropy just within this box by rearranging the occupied state which is represented by the squares. Now, if you, could, if, if you do the free expansion, you go to larger space, then there are many more quantum states appear, so it, states become more dense. And so there are more empty states there appearing within the same energy scale. Now you ask yourself how many configuration you can do by scrambling this occupied state, rearrange the dot with square. You get an exponentially large number of the configuration associated with this case, compared with this one, and that basically infer that entropy is produced and it's not reversible. That's a standard the second law of thermodynamical argument. And if you had, if you, you know, start with the box and increase the volume by factor of two, the entropy per particle increase actually log two. You just by simply counting how many more states you have. And that's a irreversible process. Energy is conserved, the entropy actually increases. That's another famous example, of course, is adiabatic expansion. So in that case, you expand slowly maintain equilibrium almost everywhere, the entropy is conserved, but then if you expand it, usually you result in the cooling of the gas. The add the cooling. The universe is cool for the same reason. That it starts from the Big Bang, you know, more than a mid a billion degree high at the beginning and then cool down to 2.7 Kelvin through this cooling process. Now the near the critical point, the conformal dynamics does something very dramatic. It conserves the energy, that's pretty obvious because it's just the unitary evolution, right? But they actually simultaneously conserve the entropy. Nothing's changing. So if you look at the, look at the, just interesting the entropy dynamics, you can again count the number of the configuration you can have at the end. You find out it's the same. But there are more states available, but the, 
the statistical temperature actually also rescale in the same way. So the number of the state you can create by rearranging the occupied states, the rest squares actually are the same as this one. Schematically, that's shown. Okay, so that gives you something really dramatic. It's the third, third paradigm which wasn't known to us. Um, and, and it seems to be possible to do that. So we spent two, three years to clarify this is possible from a theory point of view. And then um, we recently found out actually it's possible to look at it in a certain semi-realistic way. Okay. So that, that's basically the, the, the thing I want to talk about. And why the flashback resonance is relevant? Okay, so Deep gave a very good introduction about flashback resonance. I think everybody in the AMO knows that. Uh, so I can reformulate a little bit. At this stage, it might appear very innocent because it's just a different way of looking at the flashback resonance. But then the symmetry will come out naturally. Okay, so I'm not going to show that, but I just show you that it's possible to think about flashback resonance as a critical point. Now, um, normally I think uh, most of AMO physicists like to think about flashback resonance. So this is like, you can think about this is a scattering length and that's a resonance, okay? That, you tune the interaction to the point of resonance. This vertical axis is the density. If you think about the density versus the interaction, then you get a sitting this point, which is in a effectively quantum critical in this sense. The transition is not at any finite density, but at the zero density, there will be a transition. The better way for us to look at it, usually what we think about is, think about the chemical pressure versus the interaction. This is the point of resonance and Below it, chemical potential is low enough, you get a vacuum, no particle, and then you gradually increase temperature to start to feel. And the transition along here is the free fermion. Here actually gets becoming free boson. At this point has this particular point sitting there has exactly the emerging scale and conformal symmetry. So that connects to the general uh, you know, pedagogical picture of quantum critical. So what we try to do, uh, it's not too much to understand the crossover physics that's being understood very well. What we try to understand is, okay, this, this is an extra symmetry on top of uh, other things. And normally it uh, doesn't exist when you move away from it. What's the dynamical consequence? And so that's the, the main prediction at the conceptual level is basically you can have those dynamics which conserve both energy and entropy. So unitary evolution with entropy conserved and far away from equilibrium dynamics. That's pretty amazing. And I'll just give you a schematic picture about why it's so. And uh, this is a coming out of the calculation. So because of the, so again, this is a chemical potential. This is the interaction, or you can think about one with scattering lens. So scattering lens divergent at this point. I just draw it in a different way. Um, nothing different from what you know already about flash bar resonance. That's the one thing coming out of this one if you take advantage of this conformal symmetry is that, so this actually, the thermodynamics um, was sort of a study there. Well, our main you know, contribution is to understand entropy dynamics and then find out how to, how to do the non, far away from non-equilibrium dynamics. So it was realized that if you're sitting at this point, then there's a set of states which are exact and particle state, n can be infinite. So this corresponding to you put this in the trap gas, put in the harmonic trap. And at the, only at this point, your many body stays equally spaced with two times of the harmonic frequency. There are no renormalization effect, no other effect. It's a very clean result. And you get a many, many different towers labeled by the different angular moment, exactly. I show one of them. Um, and this was actually was used to understand the trap gas problem sort of known to a certain group of people, not best known result, but known to people practicing field theory. And that can be related to the early results in the non-relativistic field theory development that they realized there's a conformal proof sitting there. Um, what we realize is to understand, it's important for our understanding of com uh, entropy dynamics is that this is a singular point only true for resonance. If you move away around either side, the spectrum will be scrambled. And the, the way the spectrum is scrambled, especially for those highly excited state, it's very similar to the, uh, in the nuclear physics that if you have highly excited state, 
those state will develop chaos because of a random matrix effect. So if you have even the full fermion operator interaction, if you look at the matrix M and between two highly excited states, generically, they get a statistical problem. So it's a completely scrambled. So you, this structure will be completely destroyed. So the reversibility or the zero entropy production statement only true at this point, once you move away on both sides, you start to produce entropy if you do this non-equilibrium, far away from equilibrium dynamics. So that, that was the, basically the main result we got. And, 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 and I'm gonna, now I'm gonna talk about very simple, uh, potentially <laughs> achievable setup. So what we suggest uh, recently, again, it's all driven by the observation of zero entropy production at that particular point. Zero entropy production is necessary condition for the reversibility. Entropy itself is difficult to measure, but the reversibility, there might be a chance we can verify it experimentally explicitly. So we, we try to think about how to, how to observe a reversible dynamics. So here's what we think about. You start with, it's not draw proportionally, and let's forget about the dash line. This, Omega not referring to the trap frequency at the beginning, you initialize your state. You have equilibrium trap gas in this very tight confinement. And then to mimic the expansion in the free space, you, once you prepare the state, you let it expand in a very, very shallow frequency. Okay? So the final frequency will be much less than this one. This is not best plot, I mean, I, I should brought another plot, but this frequency should be much lower than this one, so it's much, much flat. It's almost like expanding to the free, free, free space. Okay, so it's, uh, similar to the free expansion, uh, free expansion setting we, we are familiar with. And we make it, in addition to that, we make this whole process, this whole action, uh, time reversal symmetric in the sense that if you look at the frequency, I begin with this one, initialize my state, and then I flat out and hold it for some time and then switch back to the original trap. And in this way, what I look at is basically I let the system have unitary evolution between these two points where nothing's changing. The Hamiltonian is static, okay? The state is evolving. So standard unitary evolution where energy is conserved. And then at this point, I, hope I switch back. I try to look at how, how many particles I can collect at the position of the initial state, initial box. And if the state is not reversible, I expect I collect very little because I expand most of the particle left to that small region. But if it's reversible, there's a possibility that I, at arbitrary long time, if you fine tune your time, you can still collect larger number of them. Okay, so that, that's basically a way to check whether the entropy is conserved or not. Just look at the dynamical reversibility. And this is what we found out. Um, so this is a look at, this is a rescaling factor. What is important, rescaling factor corresponding initial state start from here, which is one. And it will go up and down. Every point here representing a far away from equilibrium state has nothing to do with the state defined in this static potential. We know how to think about those states and we can prove those states has nothing to do with the thermal state within this uh, flat, it go through some very fancy paths, and it can come back okay, periodically. And this frequency actually matched the conformal power structure that I showed you a few minutes ago. Okay. And so if you, if you happen to keep your holding time, which commercially with this period of this motion, then you switch on at this point, all the particle will come back to the original box or original trap. If you switch on the other part point, you get a less. So the particle you can collect it in the original trap after holding time will oscillate. And this is a typical signature of the reversibility. It's almost like a spin echo experiment. If, you're in, if, uh, if you're, you are familiar with the NMR, that, that people do the spin echo to check the reversibility of the dy spin dynamics as well. Similar idea, okay? except here, you know, because it's a manual body. You know, the spin echo usually done for the one single spin, one single two level system. Here is, you can have, you know, a million particles sitting there. And then we talk about the reversibility of this uh, many body state. So quite dramatic. 
so that's that's the first result and the next thing is okay to see whether this is indeed only associated with one particular point so this is a parameter basically effectively rely on the correlation length how far you are away from that critical point as i showed you before once you move away from critical point we expect those conformal tower structure very nice structure will be scrambled randomly and will be described as a random random matrix theory and so this quantity basically tells you so 0.4 which means relatively far away from those conformal symmetric point and you will see that if you there's a, there's a thermalization time you can read out from the rescaling dynamics and the thermalization time turns out to be um, actually inversely proportional to the viscosity which controls how much entropy is produced during this hydrodynamical process and there's a nice scaling uh, relation between the two but anyway if you look at so this quantity equal to zero means you are sitting at a resonance fully reversible and let's go to the worst situation which is this point which is moving away from resonance with some distance and then you can see if you're sitting here if you do this time reversal action it cannot collect the particle back to the original trap it's, a, it's a basically this line it's the asymptotic line where uh, the state that state sitting here the state sitting here is basically the thermalized state in the, 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 um, the shallow path basically saying that the particle after expanding they will just thermalize it and never comes back to the small region you want. so that's the characteristic of uh, irreversible dynamics that we are familiar with. We go back to the standard paradigm. And so the, this equal to zero limit is there. So we did the two things. This is a more like <laughs> rely on the hydrodynamical understanding. And the previous plot I show you actually was obtained by the conformal tower CFT construction, which is very different. It's more microscopic. We can, we can keep track of the density matrix and look at the, exactly how entropy happens. Both method give you the you know very consistent result yeah. so that's um that's the topic i i want to uh i want to bring up here i think it's a it's a good audience <laughs> to, to share this story and, and thank you yeah and by the way i, I want to thank the organizers and uh, um inviting me and you know um i i actually i decided at the very last minute and, and i think the organizers accommodate me thank you yeah. All right, maybe by the next speaker sets up, we would have time for a quick question if there is one. Uh, yeah. So when we talk about non-equilibrium or out of equilibrium dynamics, um, where would you care, where would you put things like delta kit cooling or delta kit collimation? where you have a free expanding system, but then you collimate your, your beam or your atoms so that you decrease the temperature suddenly. That's also quite an out of equilibrium type of process. So I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering where, so you, you listed three three areas where you have different types of ex expansion and dynamics. So you have free expansion, you have adiabatic expansion and conformal dynamics. So where would you characterize something like delta kit cooling or delta kit collimation? Okay. Well, we can talk later about it. I'm just, I'm really curious. Yeah. No. Yeah, we can, we can chat later. All right. Um, are there further questions? Oh, yeah, sure. Curious if, uh, how dimensionality plays in and if it's 3D, do you require exactly isotropic uh, confinement? on the dimensionality. So all the quantum criticality actually rely crucially, crucially on the dimension. So the particular example uh, I talk about closely related to flashback resonance is only for three dimension. Um, two dimension is, um, doesn't have this property. Uh, two dimension 
uh, there's no non-trivial uh, critical point except the non-interacting fixed point. So everything is scrambled, yeah. Um, and so therefore require this isotropic three-dimensional potential, which I heard it's very difficult to make <laughs> in labs. So I don't know if that's the reason why, why this become challenging, but that can be one of the challenges that, uh, but uh, let me say this, even, I think even if it's not perfectly, if you don't have perfectly isotropic trap, um, if you do that, the main problem here is there's a shear issue. So the, the issue I talk about the entropy, zero entropy production is mainly associating the hydrodynamics associated with the bulk viscosity. Um, if you have anisotropic one, like what um, I think John Thomas studied in for many years, they usually, the shear dominates. Therefore, even if you're sitting at the resonance, um, strictly speaking, it's not reversible. It's, just, it's irreversible because there's always produced entropy. However, even if you have anisotropic one, you might be able to see a weak version of what I talk about, which means you might be able to, um, you know, uh, the bulk contribution is still minimal. So you might be able to identify that one. Um, but the, the, the key issue is that uh, you want to start with, um, it's, it's kind of uh, creating a tsunami effect in using the coal gas. You start with very tightly confined, uh, which start, that, that stay from the point of view of the flat potential is highly exciting, contain huge energy there, and you let the atom flat, the whole, you know, soft trap. And, and, and that's a kind of a dramatic thing that if it can come back, that's very, very dramatic. Um, so even if it's an anisotropic one, if you can choose the frequency of the initial one is so much larger than the final one, you still maybe see something near that resonance, maybe not a zero, but a dip there, it's still you can have, say it's a sort of weak version of what I'm saying. So that can be, can be useful, yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Then our next speaker is Eric Freeling from UBC, talking to us on deviations from universality in uh, lithium-6 dimers. Thank you. <laughs> 